Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I had several requests that people wanted me to show how to make mead. And so since I have a lot of older honey that I'm trying to work through, I figured I'd go ahead and get some started and uh, show you how I do it because it's actually very very simple and I'll be talking to you through a few things that I may not show in this video and any other questions you may have on making wine of any kind you can go check out my winemaking playlist or the last video I did where I answered several questions and I will link to both of those down below so when you're making mead really all you need are two things honey and water. You can actually do it without having any kind of fermentation starter. But to speed up the process, it is a good idea to have some type of ferment starter. Now some people will use a wine yeast, some people will use a bread yeast even, but the cheapest method, which I also think helps lend to the flavor of the mead, is to use your own fermentation starter, whichever kind that it is. Now, I have uh, several videos on the fermentation starter, how to make it, how to use it. I will go ahead and link to my most in-depth one. I know it's long, but I answer a lot of questions in that, but it is a simple process. I will link to that down below, and you can make it with any fruit or even ginger root that you have on hand. I always use some kind of fruit, whether it be dehydrated, freeze-dried or fresh. Those are the best ones to use in making a fermentation starter. And so in here I actually have a combination of uh, blackberries that have been frozen and because frozen works too. Uh, I just find I get the best results if I combine it with dehydrated, freeze-dried or fresh and some de and freeze-dried raspberries. And I'll actually be adding a few more raspberries to this when I strain it out. Then the other thing is I have always made flavored mead. So I'll be inserting a few pictures here showing you some of the different flavors and types that I've made through the years. This is actually the first time I've made mead in quite a few years, but it is actually easier than making a, just a regular wine out of juice. Now, as you can see, one thing about honey, though it has an indefinite sh shelf life, it can turn dark and the flavor can change over the years if it sits. And so I've been restocking my honey supply and trying to work through this old stuff. And that's why this is so dark. It's actually quite a few years old but we'll, it still has a nice flavor and it will still be great for making mead. Now back there in the corner, I'll go ahead and put a picture of that right here too, so you can see it better, is the mead that I started yesterday and that is a raspberry mead. Now all of the meads I have made in the past were made with fresh fruits of some kind that I pureed up and added into the mixture or as in the case of my orange spice mead, I'd like to slice the oranges up rather small enough that they could fit into the uh, regular gallon jug lid and then toss in some cloves and some cinnamon sticks and that made a really good mead. You're just adding flavor to it. Unlike wine, you're not actually using a straight juice to make mead. The mead is based off the honey. It's the sugars in the honey that's going to ferment. And yes, honey ferments excellently, raw honey. So even though honey is a natural antibiotic, it does not kill off the healthy bacteria that causes things to ferment. And it can be used to make a very good fermentation starter. I've done that before too. So what I have here are three cups of honey. So for every gallon of mead you're gonna make, you need three cups of honey. In one gallon sized bucket of honey like I have here, this is the size you need to make a five gallon carboy. So it's actually, honey is weighed in pounds. This would be about 12 pounds of honey, even though it's a one gallon size bucket. So one of those to a five gallon carboy is what you need. But I always like making mine in one gallon sizes because I like doing I like doing smaller batches so I can play with different flavors and different fruits. So over there, that as I said is a raspberry and I actually made that one using freeze-dried raspberries. 
and today the one I'll be doing is pineapple and mango again using freeze-dried fruits from Mother Earth products since that's my favorite place to buy freeze-dried items or or even dehydrated things that I don't grow as well or I just like to have more of in stock because we use a lot even if we grow them well like potatoes so the first thing you want to do is I recommend putting your honey in a, a large the largest container you have up to a gallon this is an eight cup batter bowl and this works really good for this I actually used to do this in the plastic coconut oil buckets but I found I like doing it in the in the glass better and so what I'm going to do is add a couple of cups of water to this maybe about three cups of water and you want to make sure that your water is dechlorinated if you're using tap water we use filtered rainwater that we collect here on our own property but any good healthy water you can come across that doesn't have chlorine in it but if it does have chlorine in it you'll need to dechlorinate it because that can slow down or even prevent a good ferment so basically you can do this without heating it and keep your honey raw it just takes a little longer you'll just want to keep stirring your honey especially if it's thickened up and kind of crystallized a bit like this has but even without putting it on a heat source at all the honey will dissolve in the water if you want to speed up the process a little bit then put it on a very low heat and do not allow it to get hot because it's best to keep that honey raw just let it get to maybe 85 degrees tops warm enough that you can dissolve that honey in there i'm going to go ahead and put it on a heat source for on a very low heat source and I'm gonna let that dissolve in there and then when it's done I'll be back and show you what I do next okay this is mostly dissolved I still have a few crystals in there in fact this is still rather cool I didn't even heat it that much I just kept stirring it and that will do pretty good at, keep, at uh, blending it in really good so you again you can get away without having to heat it at all which is nice because if you get it too hot not only will it the uh, destroy the benefits of the honey it means you're gonna to have to wait for it to cool down before you can add your fermentation starter so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put my fermentation starter in here and I need for one gallon I need one cup so if you're going to make a five gallon carboy then you're gonna need five cups of your fermentation starter so you're gonna to want to have a, probably a half gallon of uh, fermentation starter going I always leave the fruit in my fermentation starter but I don't want to add that to whatever it is I'm adding my starter to so I make sure to strain out that fruit and then it goes right back in the jar then I make sure that I feed my starter gotta get a little sugar in there about a tablespoon or so you can see now I'm, I'm using a quart jar instead of just a pint jar and add some water to it and since raspberries tend to disintegrate in there raisins do too over time I'm gonna go ahead and add a few more just to keep that nice raisin flavor going on in or not raisin but uh, raspberry flavor going on there and then I'm gonna leave my fermentation starter out until later tonight or early tomorrow morning I want to give it a chance to get bubbly let that sugar in there dissolve and then just get active and lively again you want to make sure you have a good active fizzy fermentation starter so again making sure if you decided to heat your honey that this is cooled down to room temperature before you add in your starter and then mix that in really well I'm gonna go ahead and pour what I've got here into my jug this would be easier to do in the sink Especially if you're short like me, but I don't like moving my camera around that many times. And yes, this is very dark as a result of the honey. Oh, look at all those honey crystals still at the bottom. I'm going to put those in my blender with the fruit that I'm going to puree up. What I'm going to do is add another cup of water. Because these crystals, they will dissolve. And I'm going to take my fruit. So I've got some freeze-dried pineapple. I'm going to put in about a, oh, at least a half cup or so of that. And then about another half cup or so of my freeze-dried mangoes. 
So usually when I do this, I'll use up to three cups total of the pureed fruit. You can do one cup, two cups, three cups. It depends on how strong the flavor you want. Just keep in mind, the more you put in there, that's more you're going to have to filter out later, leaving less actual mead in the jug when you're done. Or I should say strain out later. Okay, I'm going to put this in my blender and process it up. Now that doesn't have to be done. You can, with when I did the raspberry, I just put the raspberries in there. I could do the same thing, but I decided with this, I want to go ahead and process these up in the blender to make more of a puree. I think that helps add even more flavor to the meat. All right, now I got this all processed up. Look how smooth that is. We'll go ahead and pour that into the mead mixture. And if it wants to clog up, there it goes. <laughs> All right, now here's where we're going to add enough water to get that up to about right here. You don't want to get it too full. Don't fill it clear up to the neck. At least, oh, I usually go right up to about here. Well, I got a little carried away. I put a little more water in there than I meant to, but it'll be okay. Uh, the main thing you have to worry about when it really starts to ferment is it can push up into the neck of the bottle and then up into your airlock or balloon, whatever it is you choose to use. Okay, we're going to set this inside a cake pan. That's going to get, uh, just if it decides to bubble up and over, that's going to protect my counter or at least protect it from running all over the place. It'll keep it contained. And you can see back here, I have this one in a cake pan already. Now it hasn't, it's fizzy in there, but it hasn't started bubbling yet. Again, I just started it yesterday. It will take about three days before you actually see any real action happen. But it can take as little as 24 hours. It just dep depends on how active your starter already is and other certain variables remember you're working with something that is alive and so just like people just like dogs and cats it's all going to have its own little personality that's how i look at fermented things now i thought about i brought out the uh mother earth products organic strawberries because i was considering going pineapple strawberry i might try that next time but i really decided i wanted this one to be pineapple mango and uh, give that a try because uh, I did make pineapple mead before out of fresh pineapple but I've never made, made mango or a pineapple mango blend so I think this will be really tasty. Two options for an airlock can be an old tried and true method a lot of people use is a balloon. You would stretch the balloon over this is an old balloon, so it's, I'm using this only as an example, and I see it's already got a hole in it. If you choose to do this, you're going to want to put a very tight-fitting rubber band or tie around this because as this starts to ferment, what will happen is it will fill up that balloon, and uh, the balloon itself may not stay in place. It can go shooting off. Uh, when I made my first couple batches of mead, I did use the balloon method because I didn't have a proper airlock. Now, the reason I stopped using the balloon method is that it can add a latex flavor to your wine, to your mead, and it's nasty, so you don't want to do that. It may not always happen. It's going to depend, especially if it bubbles up and goes up inside the balloon, and then it's definitely going to take on that flavor, and I had that happen with a strawberry one I made one time, and it was, it was pretty gross. So an airlock is what I recommend. There's two different shapes. I have the S shape uh, airlock. I will go ahead and link to both styles so you can check them out for yourself. I'm used to the, air, the S shape because it's the one I've always had and always used. And you can usually buy this as a set where you get the, the cork, the drilled cork that fits into the one gallon jug or the one that fits into the five gallon carboy. So you gotta make sure uh, the size six is what goes into the one gallon. Again, I like keeping it simple and doing a gallon at a time so I can control each individual batch. And if one, like that strawberry one that turned out pretty gross, if one goes to waste, it's not a whole carboy full. It's not five gallons, it's only one. So I'd rather throw out one gallon than a whole five gallon carboy. Now, basically what you're gonna do, and this is what makes this one so easy, you don't have to add any more honey or sugar to this you simply allow it to sit for 30 days or until, like I said, in a few days, this is gonna start to bubble. And I'll put a little clip right here about what it should look like in a few days, the, about the speed that it should be bubbling. 
and then it's going to do that for about 30 days. Again, you're working with something that is alive. There's a lot of variables that can change the time, but roughly you're looking at about 30 days. It can take a couple more weeks than that, but basically you'll know when your meat is done, when you stop seeing activity in your airlock. So when this uh, goes back to being level, because you fill this up so your water, the water is level on both sides, and then the pressure from the gases building up in here is going to push this down and up and then all your water will be on this side. Now what this does is it prevents the gases in here, the bacteria and yeast are turning the sugars into alcohol and that process is creating gases and you want those gases to come up or, or you're going to blow up your bottles. I've heard about this happening to people that didn't know any better and just put a tight fitting lid thinking they were making wine, which they were, but the gas is built up and actually blew up all the bottles. So what that does is it allows the gases to leave without allowing oxygen to get in because if oxygen gets in, then it's going to turn this to vinegar in 30 days rather than have it stay wine. So that is why you have to have some kind of airlock. The balloon works similarly, believe it or not, because balloons are permeable, so the gases can come out of the balloons. That's why helium balloons, after a while, they start to deflate. The gases will, will come out without keeping so much oxygen from getting in. I still think an airlock is a much better method all the way around. So I recommend you get these. They're not very expensive. I think for a few dollars, you can get one of these for a few dollars. You can get a set of three for maybe 10 or something. It's hard to say. Prices keep changing lately. Things have just been going up crazy, up and down, up and down. But anyway, I'll link to what I can find that I think is the best deal. I like to have several of these because back when I was making wine a lot, I used to have, or mead a lot, I used to have as many as five or six of these going at it at a time all in different flavors. Now I also like to put a little uh, hand crochet thing under there so I can slide that without it scratching up my counter so much. And so I'm just going to leave that. By tomorrow, um, within the next couple of days, these should both be bubbling really well. Pay attention, especially when you're doing anything where you're adding fruit. If you're making a plain mead, this wouldn't be a problem. But whenever you're adding a fruit puree, the bubbling will can push that puree that's what gets pushed up into the neck and then possibly up into your airlock and if you don't check that daily and make sure that's not happening and it's usually for a short period of time like for a few days before that finally calms down enough that it's not doing that then what can happen is your airlock can clog up and then it will blow the airlock and the bung off of there and you'll have a mess <laughs> So you don't want that to happen. So you can't entirely forget about it. You do want to keep checking them. Just look at them daily to make sure that's not happening. But no need to add anything more after this point. Then once it is all done, what you're going to do, especially if you've added puree to yours like I did, you'll want to have like a one gallon container, let's say a bucket like this, and you're going to need a strainer and a piece of cloth, a clean cotton cloth or cheese cloth will work, either one. Some people use old pillowcases that they wash up. This is actually an old sheet, nice and clean. And then you're going to put this over whatever receptacle you're going to catch this in, and you're going to strain all that fruit and stuff out. You'll want cloth because it, that fruit, even if you put in whole fruit, it's still going to break up into little tiny, uh, make a pulp. And so you want to get as much of that out if you want a fairly clear mead. A lot of people will drink a cloudy mead. It's not going to hurt you. It's all good. It just depends on what you're wanting. Then after that, you'll put it back in your jug, let it sit for another day, and then uh, usually once a day for a few days, I will rack it to get a clearer uh just to make it clear. When you're racking it, that's when you're siphoning it out, pulling the liquid off the top, leaving the sediments at the bottom. So you wait until you've got a good sediment layer before you rack it. Now, I do have a video showing how to do that in my winemaking playlist. So make sure you go to the last video in that playlist. I think it's the fourth one where I show how I rack it. And uh, it, it's an easy process, but you do need to have in that one video I talked about, you know, the 
wine and mead making some of the supplies you'll need to have and one of those is a long clear tube and that's what you're going to need for racking and uh, just make sure you find one that's food grade anyway check out that video too to understand all the other things that you may need to have on hand but I say if you're first getting into winemaking, mead is the easiest thing to start with, especially if you have a lot of honey, like I have all this honey that I'm trying to work through so I can restock with a fresher supply. If you have bees, you might have a lot of honey on hand and are trying to think of some other things you can do with it. This is just one of the many things. Now, making homemade wine is a little cheaper than making homemade mead if you have to go out and buy honey because honey is very expensive but if you're growing fruit where you can make your own juice like i did when i made the apple wine i just took all i had we had so many apples last year i made a cider then took my fermentation starter and then turned the apple juice into apple wine and it turned out excellent and but you still have to add sugar to it when you're doing that to get a good wine so even though you're using straight juice it still needs more sugar added to it to get a nice strong wine if that's what you're looking for okay well i hope you found this helpful and this gets you on the road to making your own homemade mead and homemade wine don't forget to check out those videos that i will post in the description box down below don't forget to click on show more or that little gray arrow if you're on a smart device in order to see the video links and other things that we will have down below. All right, well, thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.